Okay, yeah. thank you everybody for uh, inviting me uh, to this uh, final cities conference. It's been five years plus, maybe an extra year, I think. So we've been working together with DTU uh, and a number of Danish partners on this whole concept around integrated energy systems and how to get this uh, future energy system uh, as clean as possible and working as well as possible. And so I, today I'm gonna talk about demand response uh, and how that is a key piece of the puzzle. So first off, uh, I'll talk a little bit about this from a US perspective, but I think in general, this is the direction that we're seeing around the world, which is that uh, renewable energy is increasing and, and more specifically, not just renewables, but wind and solar, which are variable renewable technologies. The US is starting to see a pretty big uptick in the amount of um, wind and solar being deployed. So currently we are at about 20% of the electricity generated in the United States uh, is uh, renewables. Obviously we're a pretty large country and um, we have lots and lots of a variety of different resources, but we're seeing significant deployments in wind and solar. And I'll talk a little bit about um, the big drivers of why that's happening. Um, the other thing that, that is happening, not only from a, a technology perspective, but also from a policy perspective, we have never had a national clean energy goal, but we do have um, currently 12 of the 50 United States actually have 100% clean energy goals. And this is a significant change uh, over the last five years where we've migrated from relatively modest renewable energy goals, probably in the order of 20% to 30% uh, to this much higher 100% clean energy goal. And that's really a big driver when you start to, to look at how all these pieces fit together. As, I'm, as you uh, are well aware, there are other areas in the world like Denmark, Ireland, South Australia, that significantly exceed these levels of wind and solar, but we wanna make sure that we create a pathway to actually accomplish this also in the United States. So what's really driving this? It's great that people are setting these 100% renewable energy goals, but at the end of the day, it's economics that, that really are a forcing function for uh, these new technologies. And as you can see here, these are the current costs of wind and solar in the US. Um, and you can see them compared to new nuclear, new coal, even new gas combined cycle. Right now, wind and solar at a utility scale uh, systems are the lowest cost forms of energy. And so this is really going to drive over the next 10, 20 years, basically all, practically all new generation that's going to go in is going to be this type of technology. And we really need to understand how to deal with the variability that these technologies introduce into the system. So uh, when we take a big picture look uh, across the US, here's a, a study that's um, currently been working on where we've connect, look at the Eastern half of the United States and the Western half of the United States. And the key piece of this uh, picture here is the fact that we need to always be maintaining this generation and load balance at every time period. So no matter how much wind or solar we put in, we also need to be able to make sure that we can uh, manage all the system wide flexibility. And what you're seeing here is sort of a day in the life of a high renewable grid in the US. Right now it's daytime and there's a lot of yellow on the map that's solar energy being produced. The blue dots are wind. Uh, as you see this line come across, that's nighttime coming. And so the sun, uh, solar systems turn off and they're replaced with natural gas. But this, you know, very in, tightly integrated system that allows us to flexibly, flexibly share power across regions in the US will be critical to how we see the future energy grid. So there's a variety of options for dealing with this variability and inflexibility. And I think under the city's project, we've looked at a large number of these different uh, ideas. And what I'm gonna focus on today is really a piece uh, right here in the middle, uh, which is loads. So there's a variety, like I said, there's a variety of other 
solutions. And that's why this is a challenging puzzle because you have to take into account all these different opportunities and the cost effectiveness of each one. But when we look at demand response or controllable load, that's really a very, uh, potentially a very big lever that we have never really dug into when we operate the power grid. Typically we let the uh, de demand act as it will. People turn on and off loads when they need power and we ramp up and down generation to meet that. But in the future, as we get more variable generation that comes on uh, in response to weather conditions, we're gonna want a controllability of the load that will help us uh, shift energy use around. And so that's what we're gonna dive into um, in this presentation. The other thing that we're really seeing as a, as a key piece of enabling this clean energy economy is the electrification of the entire economy. And so there's a bunch of studies that are going on right now. I wanna make sure that uh, at least people are aware of these. We've started to look at really what would it take to electrify um, the United States. So that means migrating off uh, fossil fuels for transportation applications, as well as for heating applications and migrating those to electricity. Now, why would you wanna do that? Really the answer lies back in that cost competitive competitiveness of uh, PV and wind technology. Because these really will become so cheap moving into the future, we want to try to tap into that extra uh, low cost clean energy source. But in order to do that, we need to start electrifying a huge variety of other technologies that don't necessarily um, uh, currently use electricity. And so this thing called the Electricity uh, Future Study is a big project that NREL is uh, in the process of completing. It's got multiple parts, but it looks across all these ranges from technologies to consumption uh, to system change to flexibility and finally the impacts. And we kind of have to take all these things into account when we look at such a massive change in the future energy system. So this kind of uh, graphically shows where you where you're, we're heading. Um, the graph that's on the left-hand side kind of shows a reference case of sort of business as usual. If we were to increase um, the amount of energy needs from 2010 up to 2050, whereas on the right-hand side, if we really start to look to electrify um, both building uh, heating applications as well as transportation applications and start to deploy a large amount of wind and solar. In this case, this is modeled at around 60% wind and solar. There's a tremendous growth in the electric power system itself. Now, basically a doubling in the amount of energy that needs to be provided in terms of terawatt hours. And so you see that drastic increase in clean energy in wind and solar as we electrify the building and transportation sectors. Um, but the key challenge there is, can we do this in a way that allows us actually to add demand response and controllability into these elect new electrification components? And that will inherently allow us to handle more of the variability that wind and solar um, uh, put into the system. So again, uh, we've been talking about this for a number of years and, and how we got connected with the city's project in general, which is energy systems integration. Really, how do we increase this grid flexibility by connecting multiple domains together that historically haven't necessarily been connected? So the electricity infrastructure, I've kind of explained how we really see the electricity infrastructure being the backbone of this new future electrified economy that's based on uh, renewable green technologies. But we also need to think about how we use that best for thermal systems, how we uh, tap into existing other fuel systems, how the water, data, and transport sectors all merge together. Okay, so now I'm really gonna focus on uh, demand response and how the demand response component of this is gonna be critical to how we operate the system. So if we take a look at the options for demand response, um, it's interesting, there's actually you know, quite a few options in this area. So you have things like the residential sector, individual homes, commercial sector, industrial sector. 
And finally, the transportation sector, as we start to electrify more vehicles, that's going to be a huge piece of demand that'll be potentially available. Um, the little graph in here shows uh, demand response and potential increases uh, um, over time. And we're starting to see this um, play more and more of a factor. And as I get to the end of this presentation, we'll show you some large scale studies of how uh, we view this being implemented across large cities. Okay, so I did want to point out some prior work that we've done. So collaboratively with DTU um, and NREL, we had a small group that really was focused on one aspect of modeling uh, demand response. And again, being able to actually model this correctly and characterize the response of how these different uh, technologies can respond to demand response signals will be critical as we plan out the future grid. So this was focused on supermarket refrigerators um, and basically developing a model that would account for how these things could respond to uh, res uh, demand response signals. And you can see a publication there that'll link to it. I'll just summarize what the outcome of this was, which was demand response isn't as easy in some ways to model as generation. Generation you can basically, when you're modeling, you're turning it on and off, and you can um, model that as power being supplied into the system. Whereas you think typically that you could do that with load, it may be just turning on and off, but the reality is, as you can kind of make out from these graphs, um, is the fact that there are uh, lagging time constants, especially when you have thermal loads associated with um, the technology. So a, a supermarket refrigerator is going to be have a cooling function, but then when you turn it off, the temperature is going to rise until it hits a set point where it can't go beyond, and then it's going to potentially require more energy when it comes back on. So these characteristics are, are critical in understanding how much flexibility different loads have. And so as I mentioned here, uh, uh, and there's a report that explains all of this. We we took a look at you know how much energy could you supply into the system, but again for how long. So this idea of around of of a saturation curve that marries both the amount of power that's available, also with the time that that's available. And so as we think about demand response how we put these uh, characteristics into the system models will continue to be extremely important because usually this is a nonlinear function that you've now added into the, the system. Uh, we've also done a variety of studies that have, have tried to identify actually the value of demand response. And in this is a, is a quick study here that basically on the top shows you no demand response and on the bottom of demand, uh, with demand response, at the end of the day, what we're showing here is the fact that by using demand response, we can reduce the number of combined cycle and gas turbine starts that are needed uh, when operating a power system over an entire year. And so that is critically important because then you start to figure, well, if we are reducing the number of all these gas um, turn-ons, can we migrate away from that and maybe go toward batteries? Can we maybe go toward even more flexible demand characteristics to help us really uh, operate the future power system? Okay, so some new work that we've been doing in this space really is, again, understanding how to correctly model that uh, demand side of the power system. And as you can imagine, the US power system is quite complex, but we've put together a, what we call this demand side grid model that takes into account the most accurate ways of modeling the residential infrastructure. Uh, so all of the buildings that are deployed across the United States, and that is based on some internal uh, products that we have called ResDoc that basically models all the deployed buildings in the United States. That ties together on the commercial side with looking at all the commercial buildings across the US. 
um, industrial loads. We work with the Oak Ridge National Lab and EPRI to develop a comprehensive database of all the industrial uh, loads in the United States. And then finally, also model the transportation sector. So as we see more electric vehicles coming online and understanding how the deployment of electric vehicles is gonna happen across the US, we're able to actually model all four components at a, at a very fine resolution. And so this model basically harnesses a lot of the work that we've done on this, but it creates a very detailed graphical uh, comprehensive load set uh, to enable really detailed analysis. And I'll, I'll discuss some of those as we proceed here. So as you think about some of these things, like on the building side sector, we need to understand building characteristics. We look at the population across the United States, uh, system costs and climates. We merge all of this data together to actually create a model of the entire housing stock across the US. Uh, connect that with physics-based models of the weather conditions and then output sort of load characteristics that you would be able to see. Um, all of this uses high-performance computing because of the massive amounts of data sets uh, that you need to merge together to create these types of models. Okay, so how can we apply some of this great uh, ideas to a large city? So Los Angeles, which is located in Southern California, you can see kind of the call out there. They are in the process of doing a 100% renewable energy study for the city of Los Angeles, which is, in case you don't realize this, there's a um, municipal utility called Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, LADWP, in this particular area. And you can go and um, find a, a ton of information on the work that we are doing with um, the city of Los Angeles and LADWP on this renewable study. But there are some critical pieces of this particular study that I'm going to highlight that focus on demand response. So as part of this, whether, as they're looking to get that city, which is a extremely large city of, I think we're there probably in the order of uh, 10, 20 million uh, type people in that space. As they look at their electrical demand uh, and then try to figure out how much renewables can be used to supply that, understanding both the electric demand as well as the demand response potential is critical. So basically, um, they take an understanding of the demand side, uh, understanding of what the utility there can provide in terms of generation, transmission, distribution upgrades to manage as much both distributed renewables as well as uh, bulk power system renewables. Um, and then go through a variety of models where they do load balancing, resource adequacy, power flows, um, all those types of analysis. And at the end of the day, understand how this is then going to impact both the economic and workforce in the area, as well as do an environmental analysis. So this is really actually probably one of the most detailed understandings of what it takes to get to 100% renewables on a large metropolitan city area that's ever been conducted. And, and some groundbreaking work has really been done in this particular study. That's why I wanted to make sure I highlighted it here. We're gonna dig into just a tiny portion which dealt with the electricity demand and demand response scenarios. So that as they were thinking about how they could uh, employ demand response, Right. They, they needed to think about what's available. So what are interruptible loads, both on the commercial, institutional and industrial sector? So really large loads, but also even as small on the residential scale. So tiny things like hot water heating, regular heating, refrigeration, pool pumps, which obviously California has a, actually a, a huge number of pool pumps in that particular uh, space with a lot of pools in that area. They have such nice weather. Um, but what are the residential options? What are commercial options? There's, there's a real big number here of potential options, but how do you understand what the actual uh, capacity to do demand response is? In addition to that, they looked at things like scheduled EV charging uh, as they roll out more EVs across the city. 
and scheduled water system operations. So we just saw a great presentation on how you potentially could use water pumping and water operations. Obviously in the LA basin, it's basically a dry desert area. They have a lot of water pumping um, in, that, in that space. So there's a lot of opportunity in that area. They, they took a bunch of demand response assumptions. So they basically were able to quantify what is interruptible load, how long could they, you know, you interrupt it for? Is it four hours a day, uh, 48 hours per year? You know, only on the top 12 peak days, things like that. They also sat down and looked at their entire water system since LADWP is not only the electric utility, they're also the water utility for the Los Angeles area. So they actually looked at their water scheduling and found that they potentially could shift um, you know, half of their water system load uh, as, as they add more intelligence into their pumping system. And then finally, they looked again at the residential and consumer end use load shifting fraction. What really could be shifted? Uh, what are the times of day that they could do this type of uh, analysis? Uh, and then finally, on the electric vehicle piece, they started looking at basically deployments of electric vehicle charging and this, and then looked at various dynamic models for how you could shift uh, the charging profiles around based on when the typical commuter profile is now. Currently, right now, it's probably all messed up from their new normal traffic. Uh, patterning in the Los Angeles area, but uh, Los Angeles is notorious for large uh, amounts of traffic. And so being able to model the congestion as well as how those would then be recharged is critically important to make this a proper study. I'll just run through this real quick where they the, the different colors here show you various load profiles. Now these are aggregated over the entire area for the year 2045, where you have industrial, residential in yellow, commercial in green, and transportation in blue. As you can see, like in some of these high stress years all the way to the right, at the end, you can get these really large peaks due to a lot of uh, vehicle charging. Okay, so I'll just run through this real quick. There's a lot of information here that I, I can't spend too much time going into the details, but one of the things that we were able to do was look at a variety of different years. So starting in 2015 to 2020 as your sort of base case scenarios, and then going from 2025 all the way up to 2045, basically, and you can see all these different colors represent different parts of that load segment. And so that you can bring all of these things together and then total up the variety of loads. But you can see way out in 2045, the, the three bars all the way to the right, under the highest stress conditions, so the highest load conditions, you potentially have over 10 gigawatts of load that is out there. Now, 10, if you think about 10 gigawatts for just this single city, I believe the peak uh, for Denmark is around 6.5 gigawatts. So this is a city that's probably got a power system that's equivalent to the entire country of Denmark in terms of gigawatt capacity size at the end of the day. So this tells you how much is out there. Then basically you had to look and, and figure out how much end use um, demand was at the time of those system peaks, right? So these little dotted lines in the graph represent that system peak, so the available capacity, but this is actually how much was end use. So how much was available uh, at that particular time? So in, all the way, if you can go all the way to the right, again, it's over six gigawatts in, in eligible demand, but you can't really use all of that for demand response. So then, uh, you had to look at basically how much shiftable load was available. And this is where the, comp the you can't really just judge it as a capacity value anymore. You need to start looking at energy because you can shift it, but then you have to pick it back up in other times. And so in this particular graph, it, it basically was showing at the end of the day that there is a significant amount of shiftable end use demand based on our analysis and studies in here. And this included EV charging, water power shifting, as well as residential and commercial opportunities.
at the end of the day, the, the thing that uh, we want to just highlight here, and again, you know, there's there's uh, many hours worth of presentation material on this particular project, but at the end of the day, what we wanted to demonstrate was the fact that we could do these extremely highly resolved descriptions of load projections for a variety of out years that included demand side changes, even when driven by economic growth, energy efficiency, and electrification in the system. Um, all these projections really looked at significant uh, electrification of the transportation sector. So you can see here up to 80% of the light duty fleet uh, turning to electric vehicles by 2045. And that is a, a huge uh, load that now needs to be taken into account in terms of demand response capability. Um, at the end of the day, basically, you could summarize this as this high electrification and demand response could un unlock over 10% in peak demand savings and potentially uh, give you the ability to shift about 10% of the load. Now that may not seem a lot, but when you're talking about 10 gigawatts and you can move one gigawatt, that's a, a big piece of the puzzle in terms of enabling higher levels of renewable technologies. And so critical to thinking about how we want to move forward with these ultra high uh, renewable future scenarios. So in summary, I kind of uh, described a whole bunch of stuff here, but the reality is we move to these future energy systems, we really are gonna have to pair variable generation like wind and solar that are gonna become the lowest cost forms of electricity with controllability of the loads and make that a marriage that works, uh, that, that provides and reduces the overall variability in the system. Demand response is going to be an, it's very important to economically reaching these higher levels of clean energy. And it's going to be critical to be able to model demand response deployments and controllability in the system. So with that, um, I'll say thanks. And I guess uh, leave a little bit of time if we have any questions on anything that you saw here. And uh, the slides will be available uh, along with all of these resources that you can then dive into a little bit more detail. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. It was super interesting getting a glance at how things are looking over from the state. And that's seriously, there's a lot of similarities to pick up on. We have a lot of questions coming in and you have left space for it. So that's even more fantastic. Uh, I will start with uh, Jan Vidbjerg, uh, who has a question. So I will let Jan raise his question uh, himself. Yes, I can do it pretty fast. Is uh, vehicle vehicle to grid part of the analysis? When yeah. So yeah. So vehicle to grid actually was not part of the analysis. It was only uh, charging of the electric vehicles. Right now in the U.S., I would say we haven't seen uh, a big push, especially from the manufacturers, to uh, even allow EV charging or V to G, mostly seems like a battery warranty issue. Um, and so I'm not sure if that is how, how much in addition to just controllable charging that you would get as a benefit. Obviously you get some, but controllable charging probably gives you the majority of the benefit from electric vehicles. Okay. Thank you. And then we also have a question from Dominic Francio. Um, Fancho, yes. Dominic, over to you. Um, hi, Ben. Uh, hey, Dominic. <laughs> nice to see you again. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding the demand response today. So is there a value for companies uh, operating in the U.S. markets uh, to use demand response today? And uh, what is uh, like the minimum demand response load needed so that you can uh, bid on the markets actually? Sure. Uh, so the answer is yes, as long as you are in, um, inside a market. <laughs> so in the US, it's a big country. We actually only have um, bulk system markets in certain locations. Now it is probably a, a majority of the US and a majority of where the load is but it doesn't, there's no overarching market across the entire US. That being said, that inside those markets, you can definitely um, aggregate loads and bid into demand response. And in fact, 
there, uh, in September, and maybe Shmuel will talk about this in the next talk, um, we just, uh, FERC just passed a new order. So FERC is our federal and uh, regulatory commission. Uh, uh, FERC order number 2222 is uh, specifically enables um, aggregation of distributed resources into bulk system markets. So now we have basically the federal, a federal rule that says you have to allow aggregated DER into US markets, which is really gonna open up the possibilities for not only demand response, but aggregated generation, virtual power plants, all those kind of concepts there's now an actual federal rule that allows that. Um, so that, so there's lots and lots, there are many companies in the United States that are doing this aggregated demand response. I believe the, the minimum amount is only 100 kilowatts. So, so it's pretty small uh, barrier to get into in terms of aggregation. Obviously that's more than, you know, several homes, but you could think about uh, sub developments of homes, large buildings, campuses, all of those being aggregated and doing some level of demand response that could bid into a market now. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. And Henrik, we just have a short time for you raising your question as well to Ben Kruposki if you wish to go ahead. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Ben, for an excellent uh, presentation. What is uh, the role? You're talking about electricity, electrifying everything. In Denmark, where we're talking about energy islands, we are talking about the hydrogen grids. We do that in mm -hmm. Europe also. Um, and uh, and I have heard that on the east coast of the US, the, the possible capacity for offshore wind could be 300 gigawatts. So doesn't that call for mm -hmm. some hydrogen grid, uh, grids or something like that? instead of electricity or? Uh, potentially. I mean, definitely hydrogen is going to be um, a, a, another key component. It's I, I see it as being just a little farther out in terms of development lag time, whereas offshore wind is actually about to happen in a very big way in the United States. New York just opened up roughly a 10 gigawatt spot, and they have now mapped out all the areas that they're going to be doing offshore wind. So definitely, like offshore wind is about to take off in a huge way in the United States. Yes. That being said, you know, is it, is it best to just bring all that in electricity? Uh, you are, you, the, the good thing about the East Coast wind is you're very close to load centers all along the East Coast. So you can bring in electricity directly. There hasn't been a huge talk about making that into a hydrogen pathway yet. But I think as we get higher and higher levels, again, hydrogen is going to be another opportunity for for doing this shifting of load that we have that we'll have to tap into. Thank you. 